Today we're going to be in Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. If you're using that Bible underneath the seat in front of you, that's going to be on page 811. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24, page 811. While y'all finish turning there, I'm going to pray real quick, and we'll get going. And Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much just for this beautiful morning. Lord, thank you for uh, every heart and soul that you brought together here uh, with great purpose this morning. Uh, Father, I pray just as we professed in song, Lord, that Christ would be the cornerstone this morning, Lord, that you would speak powerfully through your active living word, Lord, that you would sharpen us, you would soften our hearts with the love of Christ, Lord, that the weak, all of us so weak, would become more strong and strengthened by the love of Christ this morning. Lord, we need you to do that by the power of your Holy Spirit and your grace and the love of Jesus Christ, Lord. So please be big. May we stand firmly behind the cross this morning. We love you. We pray and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Thanksgiving, right? That's a few days ago. And so uh, leading up to that, I've been thinking a lot about the word Thanksgiving, okay? So I was like, man, what is Thanksgiving? Why, why do I celebrate Thanksgiving? Okay, so just you know, fun little activity, right? When, when someone says Thanksgiving, what's the first thing that pops in your head? Okay, so if I'm being honest, the first thing that pops in my head when I, when I did this exercise with myself, right, was turkey, family, football, right? These, these are the things that naturally pop in my head when you say the word Thanksgiving. Maybe those are the things that pop in your head. Maybe it's pilgrims, maybe it's Indians, maybe it's your Uncle Joe that you can't stand. Like, I don't know who it is or what it is, but, but something pops in your head when you think of Thanksgiving. So I was like, I really don't think that that's what Thanksgiving is. So I go to dictionary.com, Thanksgiving. Here's what, here's what dictionary.com says Thanksgiving is. It's the act of giving thanks, grateful acknowledgement of benefits or favors, especially to God, a public celebration and acknowledgement of divine favor or kindness. What it didn't say, it didn't say the act of receiving. It didn't say acknowledging what a chore it is to put up with other people. It didn't say a celebration of food and football, right? Because if you're like me, Thanksgiving is much more like thanks receiving. Thanksgiving, I make Thanksgiving all about me. Are we going to have, like, I won't, like, you know, I love my brothers to death. One of my brothers uh, could care less if there's NFL football on. I care very much if there's NFL football on, right? This needs to be about me, right? I care very much if there's certain food items there. Uh, I, I make Thanksgiving all about me, and that's, that's, that's not a good thing, right? And so I think the same can be, can be true of us, um, not that football's a bad thing, not that food's a bad thing, family's a bad thing, but it's not the main point. Those are good things, but, but they're not the main point, right? And so the title of today's message is Living in Thanksgiving, right? And so how do we live in Thanksgiving? How do we actually truly live in Thanksgiving? And so, man, my hope, my prayer is that that's what God uh, teaches us and, and gives us today in his word of how we can live in Thanksgiving. So I'm going to read Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 24. This is Jesus talking. He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, the whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. So that's the word of God. That's where we're going to be today. And so today's scripture, today's message absolutely deals with money, right? And so people, oh man, money, right? But hear me, uh, it does deal with money, but, but there's so much more here as well because Jesus presents this in a way that reveals our faith in God is impacted by how we view and handle our possessions, right? Because money is an important thing to talk about. Uh, we, we all at some level have money. We all struggle with money, whether or not you want to admit it, right? And so it's an important thing, but it's not the main thing, like we were talking about a minute ago. Um, and so that's what I want to get to, this, this big main idea that, that God doesn't just want us to give. God does not just want us to give. He wants us to live generously. He wants us to live in thanksgiving. He does not just want us to give. He wants us to live generously. And obviously money is, is a hot button topic in, in pretty much any area of life. Um, but Jesus talks a lot about money. About 15% of his, his teachings dealt with money. There's over 2,000 verses in God's word that, that deal with money. 
But here's the deal. Whenever Jesus talks about money, he's also focusing on much more. He's zooming in on magnifying uh, our value system. He's, he's connecting our value system with how we steward finances to the condition of our hearts. Okay, and he cares about our value systems that we all have because he wants us to value him. He wants us to find our value in Christ, right? So he cares about our value systems because he cares about our lives. He cares about our hearts, right? And so he talks about money because money is a pretty good barometer of a few things, right? As we talk about money, it's a good barometer of trust. Do you trust God to provide? Do you trust God to provide all that you need? Money is a really good barometer of character. Do you own your possessions or do your possessions own you? It seems like a silly question, but, but we're all very guilty of our possessions owning us. It's a good barometer of contentment. Is Jesus truly enough? Is Jesus all that you need? Is Jesus truly enough or is it Jesus plus stuff? Is it Jesus plus things that provide you with contentment? And so depending on how you were raised, we all have different views on money, right? We all have different views on, on money. So maybe if you grew up in a household that, that spent a lot of money, right? You grew up around spenders. Maybe you're a spender yourself, right? It's, it's the whole idea of if, if you've got it, you might as well spend it, right? Instant gratification over delayed gratification. And then there's those of us that maybe you grew up uh, poor or you grew up with less money than those around you. And so typically, uh, those people have, have two ways that they grow up uh, to view money. Either one's materialism, right? You didn't have stuff when you were growing up, so now, man, you love stuff. You want stuff because you didn't have the stuff. And the whole culture around us, man, that tells us that's what we need. Society, culture, people are telling us all the time that we need stuff, right? It, it connects our value with possessions. It only thinks about the here and the now and not eternity. Materialism says that we don't have enough, right? And to show our worth, we need to be able to say, look what I have. This is where I find my worth. This is how you know I'm important. Look at my stuff. The other way that you can respond to growing up with maybe not a lot of money is workaholic. You can be you, workaholism, right? You didn't have a lot of money growing up, so you work your tail off, and you work yourself into a pulp, you work yourself to death to make sure that you never get back to that place again, that place of, of helplessness that you felt when you didn't have money, so you work and you work and you work and you work and you work out of fear of getting back to that place. But God gives us a different way to respond. A different way to respond to money than the world gives us to respond, and that's generosity as a lifestyle. Generosity as a lifestyle. And this is not a view that sees money and possessions as evil, but rather Jesus wants us to understand that our position is one of stewardship and not ownership. Our position is one of stewardship, not ownership, because everything belongs to God. God is the creator. Everything else is his creation. Everything belongs to him, and anything that we have, he's entrusted with us to steward not own, because he knows that the things we own tend to begin to own us, right? And so there's, there's kind of several ways that, that people in the church can respond to this generosity as a lifestyle. There's two ways we got to reject, and there's one way that I believe that we need to embrace that God's telling us, right? So a lot of people in the church, as, as you begin to hear this generosity as a lifestyle, they can respond in a way of defensiveness, okay? And this group of people, uh, they, they see giving as something that's strictly between them and God, Okay, so therefore you can't tell them anything about their wallets, anything about their purses, anything about their bank accounts. They come up with their system on exactly how they should give, what they should give, and you don't need to tell them anything about it because they're the end-all, be-all on, on that, that subject, right? It's, 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 it's something that they hold very tightly to. You can't challenge their numbers. It's much like Pharisees, right? It's, it's very defensive when it comes to giving. The other, the other uh, way to respond is denial, okay? So these people either initially are this way or they grow over time to be in denial. They they don't see the point in giving. They don't see the point in giving money, right? They hear that, that God doesn't need their money, so they're like, so if he really actually doesn't need my money, why should I give my money? He's, if he's the God of the universe, he doesn't, he doesn't need my money to do whatever he's going to do. Uh, and so they just stop giving because they believe that lie that serves them well. And so these people, they get used to, to receiving. They get comfortable living in a constant state of receiving, and they don't see any issue with their perspective, right? Because they, they believe that lie so much that they believe it to be true. Uh, they may give their time, they may give their energy to things that benefit them, that serve them well, and count that as the way that God has called them only to give, or they feel guilted into giving in that way, right? But they hold very conservatively to their finances because, because they're in denial that, that uh, God calls them to, to give that way. Now, what I believe God wants us to respond is in deference. This is the way that I believe God has called us to respond when it comes to 
uh, this, this generosity is a lifestyle. Because when generosity is a lifestyle, we should defer to the Lord on how we use his resources that he's given us. We should defer to him with every resource that he's given us for him. First and foremost, our time, our talents, our treasures, our money, we should defer to him in everything. Through prayer, we should defer to him. In his word, we should defer to him. In community, we should defer to him. We should defer to the Lord on our finances and everything else. Deference is a position where we realize that, God, uh, that, that God's given us everything and he's entrusted with us so that when he says to give more, we defer to him, not with what we want first. Right? So if God's stirring our hearts, if we, if we feel convicted by, man, the Holy Spirit to go out and adopt an angel, right, we defer to the Lord. Man, maybe we buy one less gift for our kids or our nephews or our cousins or ourselves and, and, and we go buy a gift for someone that, that would be greatly ministered to to buy a gift. Maybe we give up a, a dinner with our spouse and just eat in to, to, to bless someone that God's stirring our hearts for. We defer to the Lord's conviction in that way. Maybe God's, man, stirring your heart. He's calling you to give up one of your nights in December to go deliver these presents to children. Man, and prayerfully ask God that he would allow you to be a conduit to share the love of Christ with someone. And you use the time God's given you, defer to him as to what to do with it and serve someone else well. This deference is what I believe God calls us to, to defer to him in everything. That's, that's living in thanksgiving. And so leading up to these verses here in Matthew, man, Christ did something that would have rocked his listener's world, and, and it probably rocks many of our worlds here this morning, right? He challenged this value system. Like I said, we all have a value system. Uh, it's, it's, it's our personal hierarchy of values that we all possess, and they're demonstrated by our choices, right? We all have a a value system, you could, you could take a look at your life if you're able to and see uh, what you value by this, right? So I'll give you a couple examples. Anyone in here take uh, part in Black Friday a couple days ago? I did, a little reluctantly, but we, we took part in Black Friday, okay? So here's the deal with Black Friday, right? We, we value Black Friday because, man, we value a deal, right? We value a discount. It's amazing, right? Some of us are even willing to put ourselves in physical harm's way to go get a deal on something. They're not giving it to you. It's just simply a sale that's worth it so much to us that we put ourselves in physical harm's way to go get something. We'll stay up till the wee hours of the morning to take part in this, and happily, like smiling while we do it, to give up time that we've been given to get something on sale, right? We'll gladly spend the money that we've had because it's like, how could you not spend your money on this? It's asking for you to spend your money on this, right? So we value these things enough to give up uh, potential harm, to give up uh, our time, to give up our money and our treasures, right? Because, because we, we want to and we enjoy it. Now, here's, here's the hard thing, right? Have you ever or would you ever be willing to put your body in harm's way to give thanks to God? Like if something involved you possibly being physically harmed, would you be like, no, God's totally worth it. Like to give this way to God is totally worth anything that could possibly happen to me today. Your precious time in the evening or in the wee hours of the morning, do you, do you gladly with a smile on your face go, no, this is totally worth giving of this for God? When you give to God, does it make you happy? Does it fill you with joy? Do you value God? Another example, and man, I'm just being completely honest with y'all. Like, I need this as much or more than everyone in here today, right? This is God preaching to me what we're talking about this morning. Because I'm wicked, and man, I value a lot of things over God all the time, and I need to be reminded of this all the time. I need my value system checked a lot, right? Just as one example, a while back, uh, my wife and I, Lauren, we had a little like staycation planned on a Friday, Saturday night at the end of the month. Super excited about it. Our love language, man, we get to good conversation over good food, time spent with each other. is just, we, we love that. We treasure that, right? So made reservations at a new restaurant we were super excited about. We were going to go see a new movie at this movie house. It, pumped, right? End of the month comes, finances have gotten a little tight, right? So I start looking at finances and going, oh man, you know what? Like this is the end of the month. I'm having to do some checking on things. Next month, we should probably uh, man, address some of these things in this area to make sure this doesn't happen again. And then one of the things that I consider in those moments is, you know what? Maybe I can, maybe I can alter my giving a little at the end of the month. Like it won't be, it won't be exactly what I've committed to tithing, but I'm just going to alter it a little. Right? Those are the things that I start to alter in my mind, right? But you know one thing I didn't even consider changing was that date with my wife. That never came into consideration. 
I wasn't going to change where we were going to eat. I wasn't going to change going to a movie. I deserved that. I earned that. These are the lies I believe, right? And it never even crossed my mind to change that weekend so that my tithing didn't change, right? And I can look back on that, and only by the gift of the Holy Spirit do I see that I valued my wife more than God. I valued food more than God. I valued a movie more than God. That's crazy. That is crazy. And it shows me how weak I am. It shows me how foolish I am. It shows me how jacked up my value system is. And I think a lot of us are in that same boat. See, the Pharisees, like many of us today, didn't realize that you can give and still be very greedy. You can absolutely give and still be very greedy. How? Because God isn't after a mechanical response. God is not after a mechanical response. Dude, after today, if you put money or write a check and put it in the joy box, and there's no joy, and you're just doing it because you feel like you have to, you're missing the point. You're not understanding what God wants from us. He wants us first to value him. He wants us to find our joy in him. He does not want mechanical responses. Many people have mastered these responses, but they're rooted in legalism. They're rooted in personal comfort. And he wants radical generosity that saturates from every part of our being. That joy, that zeal that comes from giving thanks with time, talents, treasures, finances. Because he's given us everything. See, greed blinds us and we don't see it. Greed blinds us and we don't want to see it. We don't want to talk about it because we don't want to see it. Right? That's, why, that's why Jesus gets in here to verse 22. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. If your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. And see, what Jesus is telling us is Jesus is the light of the world. So when our gaze is fixed on Christ, when Jesus is the center of our lives, man, his light fills us up. And he provides health, and he provides wisdom, and he provides joy, and it provides everything that we're looking for. And it's incredible. But when our gaze, when our eyes are focused on things of this world or ourselves, and that's what's at the center of our world, it's darkness. And what's crazy, it's so powerful, and it's such a strong lie that we actually view it as light. But that's how powerful the darkness is. We think that it's light, but it's darkness. Darkness. And it is not good. It is unhealthy. And we are blind to it. It's like such a blind thing that we even kind of see it, but we're so blind that, that, that we don't pay attention to it. We don't acknowledge it. Luke 12, 15, Jesus says it this way. It'll be up on the screen. Jesus said, and he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Man, Jesus is saying, watch out and be on guard for all greed. Right? I know Scott said it up here before, it's such a gift to pray with people. Man, I hope, I hope all of us grow in our prayer. It's such a gift. It's such a joy and a, and a gift and a privilege to pray with one another. Right? And we pray with one another over things like pride and health and sickness and addiction and lust, which are all great things to, to repent of and admit and, and pray over. Right? But one thing that I've never personally had anyone come to me to ask for prayer about is greed. We all struggle with greed, but we're so blind to it that, that we don't acknowledge it. We don't see it, right? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be on guard uh, against lust, right? Because we're, we're all victim to lust, right? Because we're all weak and foolish, so we should be on guard against lust. But th there's not a time where, where I go, whoa, that's not, that's not my spouse. I did not see that lady coming. Uh, man, that took me by surprise. No. But Jesus is saying, watch out. Be on guard against greed because we're blind to greed. You can give and still be greedy. John 3, 16, a very popular verse in the Bible up on the screen, it says, For God so loved the world that he what? He gave his only son. He didn't, he didn't just lend us his son. He didn't give part of his son. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then what Christ gave was everything. Christ gave everything for his father and for you and me. He gave his life, every breath that he took for his father and for you and me, and he gave it all. He lived more generously than we could ever imagine or we could ever hope for. And to be like Christ, 
right? God does not just want us to give. He wants us to live generously. To be Christ-like is to live generously. Many of us miss out on the beauty of giving. We miss out on the joy and the beauty of giving because we simply reduce it to just financial. We simply reduce it to finances. But God doesn't need our money. That is true. God doesn't need our money, right? But that's not the point. He uses our money. Yes and amen. Man, God uses the money that he gives us that we then give back to him to glorify himself, man, to steward things, to, to advance the kingdom, to bring people into the fold, man, to soften people's hearts with the love of Christ. He absolutely uses money that way. But he also uses money to expose the spiritual condition of our hearts. It's not fun. It's not fun to see how broken we are. It's not fun to see how weak we are. But it is a gift of grace to see the condition of our hearts. And he uses money in that way. Because our perspective on money reveals a lot about our character. This is why we're presented with biblical images in the Bible uh, in the same book in Matthew 19.24. Uh, That's why Jesus says it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person uh, on earth to go to heaven. And why in Matthew 19, 6 through 22, a rich young ruler leaves Jesus when Jesus challenges him to part with his earthly wealth. It's not that God is against money or possessions, but he doesn't want our possessions to possess us. He's not against money. He's not against possessions, but he is against our possessions possessing us because he understands that we won't be totally devoted to him. We will not live in thanksgiving. We will not surrender everything to him if, we're, if he's in competition with our possessions. So what he says in verse 24. He says, no one. So you're not strong enough. You're not able. You're not wise enough because Jesus says, no one can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You can't. It's impossible. Jesus says so. Again, it's not because riches and material things are bad. The issue is those things will not last beyond this world. Everything's fading in this world. Can't last. No matter how hard you try, how much money you spend, won't last. And when you don't have this mindset, you'll think your money is your source of life. Right? I can't be the only one, right? Somehow I think that if my bank account hits zero, it's like a video game and it's like game over. Like somehow I think that if I literally run out of money, life will end. That's simply not true. But when I have that mindset, when, when I believe that money is the source of life, I'll serve it more than I serve God. When you believe that lie, you will serve money more than you serve God. And God is our complete provider. And hear me, he's not just our provider of food. Yes and amen, he provides us with our food. He's not just a provider of shelter. Yes and amen, he provides us with shelter. God literally provides us with life itself. He is our complete, absolute provider. He provides us with literally life itself. It's incredible. Creator is always worth more than the creation. It's why in verse 19, Jesus says, do not lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. I mean, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, right? He says, don't store up treasures on earth. He's not saying don't store up. He's not saying don't store up treasures. He's saying don't store up treasures on earth. On earth. Don't store down treasures on earth. In other words, God is not condemning earthly possessions and wealth. Rather, he's prioritizing them in relation to eternity. How do we prioritize the things that God's given us? Is it in relation to eternity? Right? Like, I know some of y'all have seen the show Hoarders, right? And, and many people in here have seen the show Hoarders, and they're like, those people are crazy. Like, how could they possibly not see how, how, how ridiculous their life is, right? But I feel like for any of us, if, if God can make visible the, the invisible, like if you could look in our house at, at all the time God's given us that we hoard, because we view it as our time, if you could look in our houses and see all the talents God's given you that you hoard for yourself, if you could look at all the treasures God's given you that you hoard for yourself, it'd be embarrassing. Couldn't walk through your house from all the things that God's given you to steward for him that you hoard. Are you a hoarder or are you a giver of the things God's given you? Do not just give. Live generously. This is why Jesus talks about moth and rust and thieves, right? He talks about moths because most of the clothing back then was made of wool and moths loved to eat up wool, right? And God was showing them that their clothes weren't their source of sustenance. He was. He is. Jesus is telling us, whatever you're finding your sustenance in, it won't last. It'll get eaten up. It'll perish. 
It's either turning into garbage, or it's going to a garage sale, or it's getting, it's getting somewhere, but it's, it, may, it may provide you a little bit, a bit of sustenance for a short period of time, but it won't last. It's going to get eaten up. Rust. The Greek word for rust means to consume, right? So a big deal back then was farming, agriculture, and so what Jesus is getting at them is, is, is that their grains will be eaten by animals. This rust, it will be, this, con- this consumption of their grains will happen, right? Their grains will be eaten by animals, so the inference is that the things you're holding on to get consumed. The things you're holding on to get consumed. So maybe you're like me too, and sometimes when your bank account starts to go up a little, and you're like, this looks pretty. This looks nice. I like the way more numbers look in here. Right? And you're like, we're getting somewhere. We're finally making some ground, right? What happens? There's, there's a crazy random trip to the emergency room. There's a, there's a hidden bill that you, you're not aware of that pops up, right? Starts going down. You believe the lies of the world and, 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 you, and you think you need to buy an attractive front loader washer and dryer. Why we believe that we need our washer and dryer to be attractive, I have no idea. But I believe the lie. And then you know what happens? You get the front loader, and your clothes smell like mildew, because those things don't work that great. Right? Your clothes smell worse coming out than they did going in. So then you end up buying another top loader washer, and you spend more money, and it's just a big, big ripoff, right? The things that we store up end up going away all the time. They just do. Thieves, all material wealth and possessions are subject to being stolen. Jesus says that, that thieves can break in and steal. And the phrase break in in the Greek means to, to dig up, right? Because people back then would hide their things by digging up the earth and hiding them in the ground. And what Jesus is saying is that, man, though they're trying to hide their possessions they hold so dearly, they're going to get found and they're going to get taken. When you and I try to hold on to our stuff more than we honor God with our possessions, somehow they will get dug through and found and taken. They're not ours. Thieves will break in and steal. The point is, man, what you think you own can be taken away. And the point is, is that Jesus is saying is there's no moths in heaven. There's no rust in heaven. There's no thieves in heaven. But there is a good, perfect, amazing God that is a good, good father. He's an all-securing father. He's an all-sustaining father. He's an all-protecting father. He's an all-comforting father. And what Jesus is asking us is, who's your master? At the end there, he's asking us, who is your master? Matthew 6, 21 says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Where's your treasure? See, generosity is a GPS to our heart. And since the Pharisees and us play such emphasis on possessions. Jesus wanted them and he wants us to know that we're owned by our possessions when we treasure them. Our hearts reveal our spiritual condition. And so the Pharisees found out as they were doing this, right, they found out that if you look in chapter 6, verse 1, man, they found out they were in love with attention. Anyone here in love with attention? I am. Everyone's got, man, there's people in my life I love attention from. I want their attention. In verse 2, the Pharisees, man, it shows that they were in love with applause. We like, to, we like pats on the back, man. We like to be told that a boy. We like to be told good job. The whole chapter, man, we see that, that they're in love with themselves, same as us, in love with their tradition, religion, in love with their stuff. And Jesus is pointing out that they're not living under God's guidance. They think they are. They think they're giving, therefore they're living under God's guidance, but they're missing the point. They think that they're living by God's commands, but they don't understand God's commands. They're missing the main point. Scott talked about last week, the opposite of generosity is greed. And when we don't give, it reveals that our money is our security. It reveals that our time is our security when we don't give it up. It reveals that our talents are our security when we don't give of it. When we don't give up those things, it shows that that's also our significance. We find our significance in those things, therefore we can't give them away, therefore we fear we won't be significant. And ultimately, when we do not give of our time, our talents, our treasure, and our finances, what we're saying is that those things are our savior. We view those things as the things that will save us because we don't want to part with them. And Jesus addressing this is a sign of grace, because he wanted them, he wants us to worship him over created things. He wants us to turn from the world and turn to him. And he wants us to know that we can. 
anyone can turn from this world and turn to themselves and turn to Christ and find significance. Find life, find hope, find a savior that can only be found in Christ and Christ alone. Until we receive Christ, we'll never truly give with thanks. It'll be mechanical. In a strange way, it'll be selfish giving. Until we receive Christ, we will never truly give with thanks. We'll keep grabbing and grasping to receive other things and people that we think will fulfill us. Therefore, we'll just continue to foolishly grasp and grab at those things and those people that do not suffice. They do not last. Receiving Christ brings fulfillment. It fills us up so that we can't help but pour out thanksgiving because you're living in Christ. Colossians 2, 6-7 will be up on the screen. It says this, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Man, when the light of Christ is in us, we can't help but abound in thanksgiving. How many of you ever go to a coffee shop, tea, whatever, and you get, you get your cup so full, you get in your car, and every bump you hit, there's coffee spilling out, no matter how hard you try when the love of Christ is in you, man, when that is the eye, that the lamp of our body is on Christ, no matter what area in our life we bump into, it can't help but the love of Christ pour out. We abound in thanksgiving because Christ is abounding within us. The heartbeat of the Christian faith is good news. That's the gospel. Gospel is good news. The good news of Jesus Christ. It's not advice. It's not technique. It's not behavior. The root of Christianity is not do something to Jesus. Do something for Jesus. The root of Christianity is Jesus has done everything for you. The root of Christianity is Jesus has given you everything you need, everything you want, everything you could ever long for. That's the good news. Philippians 4, 12 through 13 says it this way. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. Leave this here for a minute. This is incredible, okay? So here's the thing. How do we live in Thanksgiving? How do we live in thanksgiving? How do we know how to be brought low and do that well? How do we know how to abound and do that well? How do we know how to live in every circumstance? What's the secret? What's the secret of facing these things? What's the secret of living in thanksgiving, right? Yesterday, before, before we came out for service, worship team, AV team, staff, we all pray together. We go through the service. Someone asked, what's the title of the sermon? I told them, living in Thanksgiving. Someone said, what are we talking about? I said, money. Right? There's a couple groans, right? And someone very, very funnily said, what are you supposed to do when you don't have any? Right? Ha ha. That's funny. Right? Here's the deal. What's the secret? What's the secret when I don't have any money? How do I abound? How do I live well? What's the secret when I have tons of money? How do, how do I live well and, and give well and live generously? Verse 13, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Jesus is the secret. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is how we live in thanksgiving. Jesus is how we face any and every circumstance in life. Jesus is the answer. Now, if you've ever received that secret, that secret is sweet to you. And it gives you comfort and provides you with peace and hope. And you cling to it when you forget, man, and you grow closer and closer to it. And for anyone who hears that secret and you think, oh, brother, give me a break. That doesn't do anything for me. You've never received Jesus. Because Jesus gives you everything. He gives you everything you could ever want, everything you could never need, everything you long for. Christ gave all of himself for you. He treasured you personally sacrificially he came down off of his throne and he took on flesh and blood to live a perfect life that you're incapable of living for you generously gave his life for you he died the death that you and i deserve every day because of our sin and he gave it generously for you and in doing so he took away the penalty of all your sin he removed all the shame and at the same time, man, through repentance of sin and self-righteousness and belief in Jesus Christ, he imparts upon us his perfect righteousness that he earned for us. So now we get the gift of the son's life and the sacrifice of his death and the promise of eternity with a good father for all time. 
And when we receive that, it allows us to pour out with thanksgiving because we've been given everything that we need. We live in thanksgiving by living in Christ. He gave all of himself for you. He treasured you personally, and he is your reward. You don't need anything else. Therefore, you can give everything else away because you've been given all that you need. I mean, give thanks. Live in Christ. Live in thanksgiving. Live generously because you've received everything in and through Christ. Psalm 6930 will be up on the screen. We'll close after this. Shout out Jack Dreschler. He put this up on our Instagram this week for Thanksgiving. I love it. He said, God's word says, I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. That's awesome. Man, when we live in thanksgiving, when we've received Christ and Christ alone, we praise the name of God with a song. You ever been so happy you just sing? Right? Like you just whistle, you sing, you're just happy. Man, when we receive Christ, man, we praise the name of God with a song. We live in thanksgiving. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. When the love of Christ is in us, we magnify Christ in everything we do. We magnify him at home. We magnify him at work. We magnify him in our alone time. He's magnified in everything because he's in us, and he's, he's the eye of, of, he's the lamp of our body. He's providing us with health. It's incredible. Man, man we magnify Christ with thanksgiving in everything we do. Thanksgiving is not just a day. Thanksgiving is a lifestyle that's only given to us because of Christ. Have you received that gift? Is that what Thanksgiving is to you? Do you need to respond to Christ today with Thanksgiving, pouring out your life and receiving his? Have you struggled with this forever? Is this something you need to lay down at the foot of the cross this morning? Do it. Repent. Believe. Receive the gift of Jesus Christ. And for brothers and sisters here today, is this something you struggle with? Do you struggle with money? Does money have a grasp on you? Something you need to repent of and grow in. Be more like Christ. Look to him. Lay this down. Don't let it possess your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much that you're a good father, Lord. I thank you that you are a father we can turn to and our failures, the Father that we can turn to, no matter how many times we believe the lies of this world. I pray, Lord, that, that by your grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, you would grow us in this way, Lord, that we would believe you more, we would trust you more, we would long for you more. God, that we would not let the things of this world possess us, but that the love of Christ would grow in us all that the love of Christ would be magnified in our hearts and our souls, Lord. And in doing so, Lord, you would allow us to live in thanksgiving. Live in thanksgiving in, in, in every area of our lives, Lord, in our, our talents, our treasures, our finances, our families, our friends, our coworkers, our neighbors, the strangers, Lord, that you would just allow us to magnify you in thanksgiving in all that we do. Lord, we love you. We need you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.